I would like to call this workshop meeting to order. Will you all please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Reed. Here. Vice Mayor Litt. Here. Council Member Woods. Here, ma'am. Council Member Marciano. Here. Council Member Tinsley. Here. Thank you. Well, as it's been noted on the agenda, this is a workshop meeting that is intended for city council discussion only. Therefore, there will be no public comment and no action today taken by our city council. Before we begin, though, I just want to check in with our city manager, Ron Ferris. Is there anything you'd like to say? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, citizens here, staff, uh, those are on live stream. Um, there's a whole lot going on in this city, a lot more than people realize. Uh, with all of the council policies, all of the development issues and things that are occurring uh, over the years, uh, staff and myself had discussions about uh, possibility of bringing in an outside agency uh, and take a look at our primary strategies that council has set over the years. Uh, we thought it would be in all of our best interest to have an outside agency view the city's, uh, again, primary strategies and financial initiatives that have occurred. So we felt that we needed some type of verification that we're headed in the right direction, not only for today, but for the future as well. The results of the study uh, that you will see here today uh, will be presented by R Randall Randy Bauer. Uh, he's the uh, from PFM Group Consulting. Uh, for your information and consideration, the report was originally designed for staff to check ourselves and make sure we were on track, but the re the the uh, report came out so good we thought we sh we needed to share that with you uh, so we look forward to your comments and your discussion and with that brief introduction of why we're doing this and why we did this i would now introduce to you randall bauer director of the pfm group consulting uh, to give you a summary of the uh, the study and uh, you have questions later you would please thank you randy thank you ron um, i would preface my remarks i came in um, from the airport took an uber and playing on the radio was the an old chicago song feeling stronger every day and i sort of feel like that's a pretty good distillation of what we found as we looked at the city in a variety of subject areas and we'll talk a little bit about that now um, by way of context pfm uh, does this kind of work with cities across the country everywhere from AAA rated credits as you all are to cities in distress. In fact, uh, we are the lead entity for a HUD funded program called the National Resource Network and that is directed at cities in distress. And, uh, and when you see a city like this one, which is in um, very good health, and compare it to those cities, you can see the stark contrast. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, throughout the remarks. But, you know, I, I think what Ron laid out was let's have kind of a, a check on our, what we're doing. And certainly there are some areas where we've made some suggestions, and we, we can talk about those. But to suggest that this is not a well-run operation, that, that simply would not be the case. This is a well-run operation. The city's got a lot of strengths, and I, I think you're doing a, a good job of playing to those strengths, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. So I'm going to uh, tell you just a little bit about PFM because some people may not be as familiar with uh, um, us as, as, um, as others. A little bit of how we conducted the project, the activities involved with it, then our findings and recommendations. Of course, we uh, hold plenty of time for discussion. So PFM has about 350 employees. We have 35, 31 offices around the country. We have three in Florida. We have an office in Miami and we have two in Orlando. Um, we have started as a financial advisory practice to state and local governments. There were five employees back in 1975 in, in Philadelphia, and we've grown to where we are now. We've been the 
top-ranked financial advisory, um, independent financial advisory firm, state and local governments for 23 years. And that's based on either advising uh, on the par amount of bonds sold or the number of issuances. So that's a record of success that PFM has sustained for a long time. The work that um, I and about 40 of my colleagues are engaged in is management and budget consulting practice. And that is what it sounds like. We work with state and local governments on the, the, their operations and the mechanics rather than just financing of bonds. Um, we were joined in 2019 by a person I think many of you know, Dr. Hank Fishkind, and his operation, Fishkind Associates, was acquired by PFM. Hank and I then led the um, economics and real estate practice at PFM until he stepped away from PFM for another opportunity uh, earlier this year. Um, he was involved in this project. He reviewed all of our findings and recommendations, made many suggestions, and we were certainly happy to have his expertise on this study as well. Um, the project team, I led the project team. My background is I spent 18 years in state government. I did economic development, and then I was state budget director. Um, I've been at PFM for about 17 years, where um, this is the kind of work that I do on a regular basis. Jay Glover is the managing director of our Florida operations, and he is a the, leads the financial advisory practice. He had significant input on the recommendations related to bonding uh, and, and your AAA um, credit. And so he was certainly important. He also has inside knowledge. He's been the financial advisor to the city on several of your um, transactions. Talked about Dr. Fishkind. Stan Geberer came to PFM with Fishkind and Associates. He has about 30 years of experience in Florida. He's in our Orlando office. He has worked on um, engagements related to uh, efforts in the county and in the city, and was certainly most involved in the work that we did on the economic and community development areas. Um, Deanna Kimball is kind of my second person on the management and budget consulting practice on the projects that I manage, and then we had also um, a senior analyst working on this. So it was a pretty good, fairly sizable team with a lot of experience that we're working on the specifics of this engagement. There were a, a lot of topics that we addressed, and uh, you know this was a fairly high-level look at um, some significant issues. It was about three months of effort that went into the draft report, and then we worked with the city to um, refine some areas where we were provided additional information, but mostly this was done in the period from January to March. Things have changed a lot then, uh, since then, uh, both nationally in the economy and within the city, and uh, you know many of the things that are going on here you're, you're on the move. You've got a lot of things going on, and we recognize that. So some of this may even just in this short period of time be somewhat dated, and, and uh, you know, that's just the fact of circumstances will change. We split them into categories. The city government budget and policy and the tax and revenue policies areas were led by Deanna and me. And then the, the stuff related to economic and community development issues was primarily um, Stan and Dr. Fishkind. And this is, these are all the topics that are included. I know you all have seen our 84-page report. I was happy to learn that a couple of you were able to read it without falling asleep. That's a credit to you all. But um, you know, one of the things that we sought to do in this, because you are a city that's doing well, so we're not going to find a lot of like silver bullets that are going to specific, significantly change your practice, was we wanted to um, create kind of a record of much of what you've been doing in these areas over the years. So you, you'll have a preface for each of the topic areas that lays out initiatives that the city has been involved with, studies that you have commissioned, other work that has taken place. And we think that's important so that the community and you all, of course, um, have kind of a guide of where we were and where we are as well as where we may, you all may be going to. Um, the, it's a typical project approach. We gathered a lot of data and information. Uh, we reviewed a lot of city financial and other kinds of reports, economic development, your comprehensive plan, uh, amendments to that, et cetera. We uh, looked at peer cities, primarily in Florida and in, within the region, just to see where you stack up on different issues. You know, it's always important to know where you kind of fit within the communities that, you, quite frankly, you're competing with for, uh, for residents, for businesses, and, um, and then I was here for two days. Uh, Stephen was a great um, host for two days. He took me around the city. I think I saw just about everything there is to see in the city in two days. And uh, we also had a number of meetings with the different subject matter experts within city government. And that was a very useful look. And uh, you know, gives you kind of a 
three-dimensional perspective on some of the issues that you wouldn't otherwise have unless you were actually here. Um, we did then uh, a lot of analysis, and we also did speak with outside um, external subject matter experts. So uh, PGA Corridor Association, the Chamber, Sports Commission. We also talked with several uh, developers or members of the development community. We wanted to get their unvarnished opinion on things. Um, I, I won't share with you who we talked with because that was part of the agreement that, okay, tell us what you really think. And, you know, I think generally they're um, pleased with things. You know, they certainly have their areas where, you know, they're, they're developers. They have their interests also. So, but they were um, a voice that we wanted to hear as well. Um, we um, then also, within the analysis, we did some case studies. We talked about benchmarking. Uh, and then we provided a draft report to the city uh, at the end of March. The city did a, their own painstaking review of it. I came back and we sat down and our team gathered virtually and went through the report. And in a number of areas, there were clarifications that were provided by staff, which, would, which is to be expected. They are truly the subject matter experts on this and we're taking a high level look at things. And we made some refinements to it. I don't think we materially changed any of our findings and recommendations, but we certainly wanted to get an accurate picture in all um, respects. And, um, you know, one of the things that we had said when we started this project was we're going to look at a number of areas. And, there, and many of them are complex. They're evolving. And if after we've done this high-level look, there are other areas that you would like us to take a deeper dive into, we're happy to do that. And that offer still stands to the city, of course. Um, you know, uh, there are some general observations that we included at the front of the report. I think they are all, you know, mostly, mostly positive. Uh, this city leadership has been proactive, and I, uh, by leadership, I certainly mean Ron and all his staff, but certainly the council as well. There, there are a number of areas we can look at. Uh, I think that you have been, you've moved forward on some things faster than some other local governments have. Um, workforce housing is a big issue everywhere in the country now. It's in fact, it's generally called the housing crisis. And so suddenly a lot of our clients are really interested in that issue, but hadn't necessarily been as interested three or four years ago. But you have kind of put in place some of the building blocks to move forward on some workforce housing things. And, you know, it's important that that be done um, planfully. And I think that you're um, well set for that. You've sought out recreational and cultural and sporting event opportunities, uh, many of which um, I've watched some of them on television. And you know, the fact that you have been able to create that sort of environment within the community is really is helpful. Uh, people see that and then they want to be a part of it. I, I said to my wife, because we're kind of at that age where we kind of like to get away from the middle. I live in Des Moines, Iowa, and it gets kind of cold there in the winter. And I said, well, that looks like a nice place to go and maybe spend some time in the winter. And then she looked up the rental rates and said, well, maybe for a week or so. But um, <laughs> you, you clearly have a lot going on here and, and people want to be here. And that's that's great. Um, we're also impressed with kind of the team-oriented approach that's taken to planning and implementation within the city. You know, you often see silos that develop within local governments where, um, you know, stay in your lane kind of thing, and we didn't get that at all. I think Ron has um, developed an approach that involves more entities than you often find, and that has included co-location of um, services within city buildings, which we often recommend and here we didn't have to recommend it because it's just kind of a natural um, way that you do things um, so and you know, there's just a lot going on here and we understand that it's even accelerated since this report has written you know that's a daunting challenge though for you all because you know you have to live up to past successes you know it, it, what you've got is what now people come to expect and, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that even in some of the other policy areas. But that, you know, that, that creates pressure. And to continue to advance uh, requires diligence, requires resources, requires planning and, you know, um, thoughtful ways of approaching issues. Um, I, you know, I, we certainly think you all are up to it, but it is something that, that you have to be aware of. Um, so in any of those situations where you are going to be talking about significant investments going forward, budget stability, this is the old budget director and me talking, budget stability is really important because there isn't anything that can derail um, efforts more than uh, a financial crisis. And um, you, you have to have the resources, you have to ensure that there's going to be some stability within your resource base, and we talk about that in some of the um, 
recommendations. The other thing is the interconnected nature. Uh, you know, Ron and staff picked the topics that we were going to look at, but I was impressed by how much interconnectivity there is. I mean, when you talk about workforce housing, most places are talking about how do you get people to jobs, and often that you know that's a transit issue. And when you talk about you know density and how are we going to create critical mass for you know, some of these um, new developments, that all, that all pulls together. And then you're talking about development, the Western development, and there you have to be thinking about how you manage that so that you don't create other issues like traffic flow issues. And in general, I think that the city is doing a good job of recognizing those things. But they're, they're, that interconnectedness is important because if, in some instances, if you kind of pull out a block, the whole thing can kind of fall apart. So in terms of the findings and recommendations, talk about the AAA bond rating, first of all. You have the highest possible credit rating, and that is helpful to you. Um, you know, nationally, it's seen as kind of an imprimatur of a well-run government, uh, and, and I think that generally is true. Now, there are exceptions on kind of both ends. There are some places where they just have such a good set of circumstances around them that it would be hard for them to mess up their credit rating. Uh, and, and, you know, that's... That is what it is. You know, I, I think you certainly have good circumstances around the, you, but I think you've created quite a bit of that also. It, it does matter. So Jay Glover and his staff took just a typical plain vanilla 30-year fixed um, bond issuance and looked at the difference between a AAA rated credit and credits that are not AAA rated. And over a 30-year period, you're talking about about a million dollars of difference in terms of what you would end up paying for that bond issuance. So maintaining that credit rating besides just what it allows you as a city to point to as an example of being well run, it also has financial advantages as well. One of the things that um, we often are hired to do for cities and counties is develop multi-year financial planning models and we didn't have to do that here because the city already has one. So that's, that's a, a strong kind of financial management tool. The problem with a lot of local governments is that they get caught in the one or two year perspective on things and it's important to be examining structural issues. You know, one of the issues that catches not only local governments but state governments are pension obligations. And pension obligations are something that you often will not get a good handle on in a one or two year time frame. The city uses a 10 year forecast model. We think that's five or 10 years are kind of where most local governments go on that forecast model. We looked at it, we, we picked it apart, made a few recommendations on some possible changes to it, none of which are really major. And um, you know, the other thing that we suggested is that you're probably gonna to wanna to make sure that you have as much, as many people as possible that can use the model and, uh, and facilitate its use. Talking with uh, the city finance director, they're in the process of doing that, they have people that they're also going to um, make more familiar with the model, and we think that's good. So within the, you know, one of the areas that I mentioned at the front, and which is certainly an important issue that you all understand is just Western growth. And that's going to impact both on the revenue from all the new construction that's going to suddenly turn into, you know, new real property tax revenue, but also on the expenditure side. You certainly are going to have to provide service for that area. Um, you know, the nature of the growth is evident. I was out there watching all the houses going up. I um, saw the golf course, which is under construction and which looks like it's going to be an exciting amenity that you all will have. Um, I, I should just parenthetically add, um, it's an example of kind of good management. We often come into cities and say, you need to outsource your golf operation because it's just, it's, you're bleeding cash. And that's not the case here, your golf operation um, runs a surplus and from what we can see is, is doing a really good job. So that Western growth is important obviously to you. That's one of those challenges it creates and we talked a little bit about well how do you ensure that it then doesn't create other problems like congestion and traffic problems. My understanding is that the city is managing that growth. I think that's kind of what you always want to look toward is build it into our plans in ways that that growth um, you know, we build mixed-use development, you have shopping and grocery stores and everything else so that that traffic in some areas is contained and allows the, the city you know, to operate uh, better than if it were not that way. Um, the one-cent sales tax, we believe that the city made a good decision to bond against 
the tax revenue at the time that they made that decision. I think if you look, you know, uh, I've been involved because of my background as a budget director, I've been involved in those decisions as to pay go or uh, bond for uh, over 20 years. And there are a variety of factors that come into that calculation. One obviously is, okay, what's it gonna cost you to borrow the money versus what would it cost you because of inflation, particularly in the construction industry, if you stretch it out over time. And inflation in the construction industry has generally been running higher than the cost of borrowing money. And particularly in low interest rates environments, that was the case. Now we're in a little bit different environment right now, that's true. But we have to keep in mind two things. One, you get to borrow a, on a tax exempt basis, which means the federal government is subsidizing some of your cost of borrowing. Um, the, other, the other factor is that we are in a higher interest rate environment, but we're also in a higher inflation environment. So the cost again of construction is still outstripping the cost of borrowing. That's a going forward issue, but going backward, there's no doubt that it, it was a good deal. And the other factor to take into consideration is just opportunity cost. You had the benefit of the construction and the facilities that were created for a number of years, where in a pay-go situation, that is not necessarily the case. So you have to weigh that in terms of what's the benefit to the community, its residents, its businesses. And, and you know, I think in any kind of calculation of that, you've done well with the decision to, to borrow in, in that case. We do think you still should consider it going forward. Understanding that circumstances have changed, you just, you just have to make the calculations and figure out with those um, characteristics if it still makes sense to do borrowing. So that kind of fits in with the opportunity in 2024 for perhaps countywide one cent sales tax for transportation. Um, you know, transportation, we've talked about it already in a couple of instances that it's really critical for growth within this area. And then there's some other transportation issues that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, one of the opportunities, of course, always is identify what would you be able to do with those resources should the county taxpayers choose to enact the um, one cent sales tax. And I think identifying those at uh, my recommendation, of course, you all will take that under advisement, would be to determine what would be possible uses or even probable uses for those resources. Um, again, we think that bonding should be considered, taking into account, as we already talked about, interest rates, construction, and opportunity costs. So stable millage rate, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I'll give you a little bit of example. We talk about it in the report. Um, I've been working with uh, a major county in the D.C. area, Loudoun County, Virginia, for uh, a couple of years. They have um, what's kind of a nice problem to have. They have a huge data center industry, and the data centers pay a lot of business tangible personal property tax. It's gotten to the point, though, that is a volatile tax source. It's difficult. That property can be moved. It's personal property, so it's movable, and they can move it between facilities. And it, and it can depend on how much um, inventory are in their data centers. So they've got real volatility in that, but they've used the fact that they have so much revenue in that area to continually reduce their real um, property tax rate. And, um, and that state, I mean, that has its challenges because the real property tax is your most stable revenue source. It will be for any local government. So ensuring that you can maintain that stability within your budget and, and the forecast that you're gonna do for revenue so that you can maintain budget stability is really important they're getting to a point of having more instability, and as a result, they have to set aside more of their resources as um, in reserve. Now, that is an opportunity cost in and of itself because you're not able to use that for community services. So we understand the situation that you are in. You've had explosive growth in new construction, and that's, that's great. And so we think that the choice to reduce the real property tax millage for you all in this set of circumstances is fine. I think it's everything that we've seen in the forecast and in the 10 year budget forecast model suggests that you're okay. But we would just um, suggest to be, to continue to practice care within that area and that real property tax is one area that um, property taxpayers look at that even though we all understand that, you know, it's a function, your actual tax bill, not only of the millage rate, but also valuation. Um, but that is something that residents and businesses look at. And so if you then have to start raising it, it creates its own kind of challenges. 
Um, use of incentives is another area that we do a lot of work with, and I've, um, I've evaluated incentive use in a variety of communities across the country. Um, your use of incentives is about on par with your neighbors. Uh, we think that you practice what I would say is judicious use of incentives, and that makes sense. You know, when you're a place that businesses and individuals want to be at, you don't necessarily have to um, spend as much to attract, but in specific circumstances for specific opportunities, um, they, they certainly have value. One of the areas that we did make a recommendation that you sh might look at is within the category of housing, in particularly housing rehabilitation, there are a variety of communities that have effective tax abatement programs. The abatement is only for improvements to existing real estate and, um, and the studies that have been done, Richmond, Virginia is an example where a study was done that showed that that was very cost beneficial for them. Given that there are areas of the city that are older where the housing could stand um, improvement, the, this may be a tool that you might consider going forward. Moving out of kind of the budget and tax and into the economic and community development findings, um, you know, the, 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 this is an example, for example, we go back to 2019, the mo mobility plan report and how that created a plan and an assessment area. Um, you, we understand that there are some issues related to how that has been funded in the past. One of the things that we became comfortable with as we talked with the city management is that they're committed to that plan and finding the resources to be able to fund it. And you know, there certainly are examples already. You have, as it was noted here, you've got projects that have been funded through TPA grants. And that certainly will be an opportunity going forward. Um, we think this is a linchpin for a lot of the recommendations and the development efforts that are going on in the city. And, and we would suggest again that when you're figuring out priorities for spending, that this is one of the areas that you definitely want to continue to make a key focus. Uh, the transit-oriented development district fits into the state, same concept to, as it relates to mobility of moving people and not just vehicles. And um, you know, we think that there are opportunities here even to expand your um, TOD district, that that can again create additional um, synergy around some of the other projects that exist. You know, certainly what's gonna happen with train station uh, what's going to happen as the FTL site is fully built out? These are all things that are going to create opportunities for you to um, think about how, what mobility looks like within the city. The tri-rail or bright light station is, is, you know, that's kind of, uh, it's an overused term, but it's, it certainly can be a game changer uh, in a variety of ways. It ties together so many of the opportunities um, to bring people into your community, whether it's workers, um, just those that are coming to the community for different kinds of engagements. Uh, and, um, you know, again, it ties together all of these kinds of community development issues. The funding, of course, is always going to be the key issue there. Um, you know, as we examined opportunities that have existed in other places, we do think that this is an opportunity for public-private partnership or P3s. Um, you know, we have, in our conversations with stakeholders, we get the impression that the city has a pretty good relationship with some of those kinds of um, stakeholders that would be engaged in this kind of an effort. So it seems like the pieces are in place for you to um, pursue that as one of the possible funding alternatives for um, the, the Tri-Rail or the Bright Line Station. You know, any city that, uh, you know, unless they just, they're like five years old, every city's got redevelopment efforts that have to also be taken into consideration and, and there certainly are, are some here. Um, we, you know, we know, for example, that um, you know, Legacy Place, Lomans Plaza, um, you know, there are all kinds of opportunities. You know, Gardens Mall is an opportunity for you to take what right now is acres of um, surface parking and change that into something with higher density, whether it's mixed use or other kinds of um, uh, residential uh, construction that can help to increase the density and kind of, again, build on what's going on within your downtown area. I think all of those should be kind of looked at from that perspective of what's the highest and best use of this available land. And in, in a lot of these cases, these acres of surface parking, that's not it. And, and this can 
that redevelopment, if it's done in a planful way, can help you to um, move forward on a, a lot of these other kinds of recommendations and initiatives as well. We've already talked about workforce housing. Um, it, there's still, though, a significant shortage, as there is really, quite frankly, in every community in the country. I don't know of any place that isn't challenged by workforce housing. So this is an opportunity for maximizing density as well. Um, and I know you've done some of that already. And um, you know we think that, again, this transit-oriented district and that area around it is kind of the um, opportunity for you to put a workforce housing strategy in place and use some of these other tools that we're talking about um, to deal with some of the workforce housing issues that um, that exist, and we already talked about gardens. Well, I guess I kind of jumped ahead on that one, but that's certainly a great opportunity. You know, the recreational amenities that you all have are are um, outstanding. So, the golf course, toured the golf course, the new golf course, uh, toured your tennis facility. I was a college tennis player. I'd never played on a clay court before, and uh, you know, and that's a, that's great because when you get to be my age, you don't want to have to run around as much, and you, at least you don't have to run as fast on the clay court. So. You have, again, facilities that are very much in demand, um, understand you know, your baseball facilities and the uh, events that that attracts, the soccer facilities. I had a daughter who played club soccer from the time she was like six until high school. And you know, those, those attract people, and they attract people that are going to spend money in your community. And so those are great opportunities. Of course, you're going to have to continue to upgrade because that's the challenge. Of people are always going to expect a little bit more from what you have. We had some specific recommendations on some facilities that I think are under, um, are at least in planning stages. <coughs> you know, you're always looking for multi-purpose fields. They're like the gold for recreational um, events for um, kids or, or even adults. Uh, multi-purpose community centers are also uh, something that are in demand and are going to be useful for your community. Um, and you know that means that you've got to continually budget not only for the facilities but for maintaining them. And that again becomes that challenge of making sure that the resources are available for the city to be able to do those things. So I, you know there's some themes that I've already talked about here. We uh, also summarize them in the findings and recommendations. You you are a city that has a curbside appeal, and uh, it's clear that there are people and businesses that want to be here. Again, we talked about maintaining that then means that there's always another bright, shining object. And so continuing to expand the, uh, what you have for the city and continuing also to revitalize that, which maybe is getting a little bit older, is important. Um, we believe that there's a commitment to excellence in this city government. Um, I'm not just saying this because you know, because you all hired us to do this study. We were hired to take a look at things, and if we had found areas where there were significant weaknesses, we, we would be saying that right now. In some ways, I almost feel like maybe I didn't do my job, because there isn't as much here as in some other places that we would recommend that can improve the city's overall operations. The new development is, is really exciting, and I've already been apprised of some of the things that are continuing to evolve just from when we were doing this work in January through March. And that's exciting, of course, we've already talked about the challenges that creates also, you know, staffing is an issue that, uh, you, this is a pretty um, lean staffed organization. And, um, you know, so that becomes one of those things where in some of these areas, if there's going to be so much development activity and all that's required of planning and permitting and zoning, um, you know, there may be the need that they'll have to look at providing some additional resources in, in that particular area. This was not a staffing study. Again, this was done at a fairly high level, but that's our experience with organizations that sometimes the bottlenecks in some of these developments can occur in those, in, in those areas of, of the city. Talk about the interconnected nature. I'm impressed by how much that's, uh, I would, obviously it's understood by uh, the professionals that you have in city government, but also by the way that they are planning around things to understand and make that interconnected nature kind of connect. And then, um, you know, there's a, this a sense of, you know, opportunism. Let's, let's strike when the iron is, far, is hot. You've done that in a few areas. Um, you've got some things that go on that used to go on in other places in the region. 
well, congratulations for you all. That, you know, that's great. That uh, helps, again, to kind of create a sense of what the community, the community is moving forward, that the community is committed to excellence. Um, you know, we believe you're generally on the right track. And uh, that's, of course, where you want to be. And uh, in general, as I said, there are some areas where we've made some specific recommendations. There's nothing here, though, that suggests to us that the city is going to um, dramatically get off the right track. And um, that's the, you know, the, the regulatory stuff that I have to flash up there. Because we are a regulated in, uh, entity in, under a few different federal um, rules and regulations, but now that you've all seen it, if there is any information, though, it's uh, in your, um, it'll be in the presentation, which I'm sure you'll be provided. Uh, Jay, of course, on any of the financial advisory issues, is the subject is the pro from Dover. Anything related to the management and budget issues, I'm happy to chat with you or anybody else about any time. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Let's see. Do I have, uh, let's see, Mark, would you like to begin? Sure. Is it because you saw my notes that you thought you, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I think this is an important thing for the residents to know what's happening in our city. I mean, we take it for granted. The staff takes it for granted because we see it every day. But of course, when you don't see it every day, you kind of wonder. And I think the council would probably all agree that we are out in the community. We talk to people as is everybody else. Uh, but we are the point people for the residents and they do ask questions and they do want to know what's happening with X, Y, and Z. And, um, and of course, we can answer that question. But having this in the public domain uh, presentation, I think this is being taped, is it not? So we can always tell pay, uh, state, uh, uh, <laughs> residents to come online and, and watch, the, watch the presentation, with the, which would make life easier for all of us, I think. I did have a couple of questions and comments. One of the questions and comments that we get um, with growth comes challenges obviously transportation and traffic, uh, but I also get questions, and I'm sure we all do, about the public safety. I had a conversation with the chief this morning, chief of police this morning, because I know that we do have, uh, you know, a SEPTED program requiring certain requirements for building to make sure that the police department has access and understands the, the new construction to ensure safety. Of course, a growing city, putting more people in an area is going to cause some friction. Uh, increases the randomness of some strange events that really has nothing to do with any particular region, but sometimes you get caught in a crossfire. Uh, there was nothing in your report about that. I don't think it was meant to be in that report, but can you comment a little bit on how you see cities growing like ours are growing, and if you have any information about how our city is developing in a way to protect the, the current and future residents from a safety perspective, and if you have any comment on how we're doing there. Uh, and you're correct. Uh, that was not a topic area that was you know, put in front of us. Now, it did come up in a couple of places. So I mentioned that in a lot of organizations, there's some siloing that occurs, particularly around development, that it's often just the planning department and, and other development types of entities. The city involves the public safety entities as well when they're having those discussions. And we think that's, that's very useful because it does provide the opportunity for the police or the fire department to weigh in on, well, what are we going to do to ensure as much public safety as we can within the development that's occurring in these different places? So that's just um, one of the things that came up in the discussions that suggested to me that they're aware of that and take it into consideration. Um, but it was not something we looked specifically at, so I really couldn't comment on how you would compare to other places as it relates to public safety? Okay, no, I think that's probably a part of our job too is as we go forward to make sure that our residents know that every project that comes forward, uh, this is a big, a strong portion of what we talk about. And I'm looking at Chief in case he has any comments or wants to make any comments on that. Sure. <clears throat> as you know, uh, Councilman Marciano, we have uh, a very close relationship with planning and zoning, looking at all the building rules, as does our fire department. So a big a big program crime prevention through environmental design or designing out crime before it occurs. Um, you know, we have a unit of the police department that looks at every building plan that comes through and that includes with follow up inspection. So it's a big it's a big program with the police department, you know, as we say, designing out crime. You know, the relationship with planning and zoning could not be better and, and the same with the fire department and the things that they look at and all the building plans. But 
And as you know, when uh, with Chief Step, um, he created a graph years ago, which we have carried on, and we update every year that shows the tremendous, tr tremendous growth and population of the city, and the descending crime rate, which uh, we continue to be at record low crime rates in the city. So. I take that to all of our community meetings, and uh, and we like to show that off because it's a it's a great a great uh, visual on where we're going. So, um, and we'll continue to do that. And I'm not trying to exclude Chief Breyer back there. He's looking at me funny. I don't know if you wanted to make a comment. Uh, I, you know what? I just wanted to say that, as you know, our fire marshal sits on on all the BRC meetings. Um, we have a very uh, robust fire inspection program. Every business in the city gets inspected annually. Um, we look at staffing. Being that we are a duly accredited agency, we look at that staffing. We look at those benchmarks for our response times. Not only do we meet them, but we are looking to improve that benchmark every year. So that's looked at almost daily for us as far as those response times, making sure that we're meeting those response times, all those requirements by the commission. Thank you. Well, I know we, we look at those data quite regularly, but I think we just need to make sure we get that to our residents. And um, uh, I do have a couple other questions. Do you want to go on to someone else? I'm happy to. Um, you can just let can me know. You, I, go for it. Let's just oh, okay. let's get it all out. All right. <laughs> um, the re workforce housing, we have constant conversations about this. Uh, we obviously have the CDBG grants. It's helped us uh, with some of the... Um, uh, older communities and, and rehabilitating older homes. You mentioned workforce housing funding going towards those things. Uh, Ron and I have had conversations about spending workforce housing dollars that we have in our budget uh, for something like that. What, and I don't know if you have the answer to this either, but you know, I'm gonna use it since you go around the country. Um, what, what type of percentage of workforce housing dollars are spent on rehab versus uh, you know, allowing uh, density and, and workforce housing uh, units within new construction? That's a, that's a good question that I don't know off the top of my head, but I would be happy to research that in some of the places that we look at that. It's going to depend on the community. So, for example, uh, we did a residential tax abatement evaluation for the city of Cleveland, and that's an old, I mean, a really old city, and the housing stock is really deteriorated. And they, so what they're going to do with workforce housing is different than a Palm Beach Gardens, for example. Um, so, uh, so I would say I'd have to look at what it was for kind of communities that are similar to yours. Um, I do think that as in any city, um, you're going to have some neighborhoods that are going to, you know, everything is cyclical. So you've got stuff that's been built recently, but you've got stuff that's been built you know, back in the 50s. And so those kind of are the areas where you can look for, are we going to do rehabilitation? as opposed to other kinds of workforce housing that may be new construction. I have one last question, then I'll shut up, I promise. Uh, the one cent sales tax we talk about for, for, um, for uh, hopeful potential uh, putting that to the taxpayers of the county for, for transportation in 2024, uh, there's always new initiatives coming from different entities, including the county commission, who we have one here tonight, today. Thanks, Maria, for being here. Uh, when it comes to housing and when it comes to water and when it comes to fire. Uh, there's so many different entities that are, that are competing for tax dollars for the residents. And when we bond it or we ask for a sales tax initiative, that has to go to the taxpayers uh, for their approval. Uh, how many times do you see multiple initiatives come up in a county like this? And how does that impact what some priorities might seem higher or lower? And, and because mobility... Housing, I mean, these are all big, big issues, and our current tax structure doesn't quite cover all those things. So how does that impact when you have multiple questions on a ballot? Yeah, you, you, that happens a lot, and uh, we see that in a lot of places. I will say that in our experience, transportation has about the highest percentage of success rate as it relates to these kinds of initiatives. People understand, I mean, everybody gets in their car and drives places and gets frustrated when they can't get to where they, they want to go. So um, transportation issues, so no, we do quite a bit of work around the D.C. area, and, you know, Northern Virginia is just is constant gridlock. And they have been able to um, get approval from voters for things in that area that maybe they have, wouldn't have been in some other areas. Which isn't to say there aren't other initiatives. You, know, you see lots of 
um, initiatives around sales or property tax for public safety, for EMS services is often something that gets approved by voters, but it, by and large, transportation has a pretty high success rate. Thank you. Mark, if uh, you want me to come back to you, just let me know. And Carl? I don't really have any questions right now. I might circle back as we talk and absorb what you guys have to say. But, you know, you, um, you know I work for the city for most of my adult life under Chief Stepp, who's now the assistant city manager, who I still call chief. And, um, uh, and I've been a council member for, all of us have been a council member for years now. So you kind of wonder how we got here. You know, why, you know, what's so good about the city and why are we attracting all this stuff? And, you know, I just kind of come back to our core values. You know, during the epidemic, we took care of our families, we took care of our small businesses. Um, the chamber folks who are sitting right here, um, we have very tight relationships with our chamber. Uh, Commissioner Maria Marino is here. And these people are, they're, they're just not people with other titles. These people are our family. And uh, Ron's staff has probably collectively hundreds of years of education on how to run their particular department. So um, as the council rotates in and out, you know, when we learn um, and we get into something that is so forensically operated so smoothly, you just absorb all this. It seems like it's so much good information. Where's the problem? You know, what's the underlying, you know, but so for me personally, it was, and I talked to Ron about this a few months ago when I knew there was a study going on um, to have somebody from the outside come in and look at the global picture of what we're doing um, because we lean on staff, us five lean on staff all the time and then we're still accountable to our constituents to make the right choice. And now we have a bigger vision through hiring you all to, to give us some more information like, you know what, you guys are, it's not just, you know, it's, it's really, it, it is really going the right direction. So, you know, and I know when I, uh, when I sign off on these buildings, I watch every single building go up and I'll go see it many times. Uh, Florida Power and Light was uh, here a few minutes ago, and he left. But, you know, we attract these technology-based businesses, and it brings in opportunity for growth and for our community. We, we build golf courses. It keeps our community here where they don't have to go elsewhere to play soccer and baseball and, and golf. So, you know, for me, I'm just learning what you're saying, even though we're, we are ingrained in it. So... I don't have any questions now. I just, you know, I don't really wonder why this city is the way it is because, you know, we live it. You know, like our our staffs are family. You know, I'm not Carl, the council member. They call, call me council member Wood. I'm like, no, it's Carl, you know. And we got green guys, Chris in the back. He's been here for like two seconds. And I hope that he will be around for a long time and he sees how the city is run and how we become family, like Maria and I used to say when she was a council member. So thank you for your study. I may come back around, um, but I just got emotional, so I had to say that to everybody who already knows it. So thanks. Well, I, I would make one comment, and thank you, Councilman, for your comments. Uh, you know, we often think about, because we're doing this work across the country in cities of all different, you know, um, on the spectrum, is what is kind of the secret sauce for cities that are at that top level? And, you know, you may have hit on something. I. I could tell from the meetings that we had with Ron and his staff that everybody's very collegial, they work together, um, there's not kind of little turf fights, and that, you know, that really helps. It's uh, a lot easier to run a government when everybody's rowing in the same direction and knows where they're trying to get. Right, and it was something that you touched on earlier um, where all of our divisions work together. There's open doors for from public works to the police to the fire, and Ron expects these these uh, these divisions to work collectively to to reach a common goal. And and maybe some cities don't do that, and then you get division, and then you get miscommunication and stuff. But here, everything's open door, you know. And I think we would probably have a bigger problem if we weren't collectively communicating as best as we could. So yeah. we constantly are bragging on our on staff. 
And, you know, and where's Kumra? Is he even here? Oh, there he is. Mr. He, uh, whatever, you don't even know how many boards he's gotten over the years. But it's just, it's, it's just, it is. It's, it's, it's open door policy communication and having a com common goal to serve the community and then you get Palm Beach Gardens, so. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I did a, we were doing an organizational assessment for a large and AAA rated city in the Midwest that, you know, does well. And they're one of these cities, I think, that just has so many advantages that it would be hard for them not to do pretty well. But there were silos everywhere. And, uh, and it was really difficult for some of the initiatives to move forward because of that. And we, you know, we made some recommendations to break them down. I don't know if that's gonna work or not. But we didn't, I didn't see any of that here. And that is a, something to you know, be very pleased with. Yeah, well, good to know and I appreciate your effort. Thank you, Mr. Brown. You're welcome. Thank you, Carl. Rochelle, I think you had something you want to follow up on Mark's question. Yeah, I have some discussion that we can get into later on, on community issues. Um, interviewing the community and talking to the community about the growth and what's been happening was not a part of this at all, was it? No, again, because it was a very short time frame and because we had so many topics to cover, we couldn't do like uh, sounding board me meetings or anything like that. We were just looking at operations and looking at you know, the specifics of different kinds of development. But that certainly, uh, I agree, is something that I'm sure you all uh, do and are aware of. To follow up on, it wasn't even on my radar until Mark kind of mentioned it. Um, with all of the different requests, the bond requests that are coming forward that he brought up, do you deal with other cities that are in states where you can't advocate or educate the people about what those referendums are and how do you get around that when you're dealing with important issues that we have to deal with? I, I guess I don't understand you mean because there are legal requirements that don't allow the you state does not allow us to educate or advocate for any referendums that we or the county place on the ballot as of last year so that makes our job inherently much yeah. more difficult sure. to get the word out i i would see why that would be difficult i'm not that's uh, unusual i'm not seeing that in um any of the places that we've worked now I don't know the, the law that you're talking about, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not gonna practice uh, as if I were one. But I would at least think that if the council's identified um, projects, that they would, in a plan, you know, if nothing else, just in a planning capacity, that might be funded from, a, from resources that seems like that would at least be acceptable. But again, don't take my legal word for it. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, an interesting idea. Okay, do you wanna go to Marcy and come back to me since I just Happy wanted to. to follow up and then I'll... My pleasure. Marcy? Thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank staff for taking the initiative to um, doing this report. I, and you obviously for writing the report, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it read it backwards, forwards, and saved a few tabs for our upcoming budget process. So I appreciate that very much. Um, I do have some questions, and then I wanted to share my takeaways from the uh, report. Um, and thank you, you actually answered, or asked, I should say, and you answered my first question, which was in regards to the community leaders, which would then go to another question. But um, the phrase growth issue um, and Western growth issues came up numerous times in the report. And I guess my question was, um, does this just imply the basic uh, challenges of growth or are you referring more to traffic or was there something specific that you meant by growth issues and Western growth issues in general? No, I, I think you're right that if we're just saying growth issues, it is just the challenges that are always gonna uh, occur because of growth. You're gonna have the, the basic planning, you're going to have the dealing with traffic, you're gonna have public safety, uh, and, so th and they're all kind of interconnected. So we sometimes point to specific instances, but if we're not talking specific, we're just talking about growth. And you know, the key always around that is managing growth. So 
and the city's very aware of that. And I think you know, a lot of what they're already talking about of how Avenir's developing and what they're approving for um, the development takes that into consideration. I, th I think they could talk more about things like counter cyclical traffic movement. I mean, I see you, if you want to add anything to that, please do. Uh, sure, I would be happy to. Avenir is an excellent example of how the city is forward thinking in trying to do growth the right way. And the proposal to include uh, a mixed use development with employment, a vibrant town center, recreational amenities, uh, schools, medical office was such an important part of that growth, which was ultimately approved out west in order to address traffic, internal capture, and a healthy community. So that's a, a really important um, example of, of how this city approaches growth, especially growth that is as significant as a large mixed-use project. Thank you. Alton as well, I guess, could be added to that. Um, Alton yeah. is another example. Yeah. Um, community outreach and education was also mentioned numerous times in your report. Um, one quote was, the city should ensure its process includes such outreach, um, uh, commented on page 27 and 38. Are you suggesting um, a charrette to discuss strategic growth plans potentially or workshops to educate our residents on subjects like TOD and uh, strategic planning, annexation, um, or expanding the TOD, uh, future surtax initiatives, is that what you're implying? Yeah, I mean, the use of the word insure doesn't imply that you're not doing it. It's just that these are areas you're going to just be mindful of it. My understanding is you already do do a fair amount. I mean, this this is a workshop right yep, here. Yep, absolutely. So, um, <laughs> so we're not suggesting you're not doing that. We just want to, it's kind of like due diligence, you know? Just right. Just make sure that as you are going through these major efforts and you tick off several that are major uh, and important initiatives that, yeah, you do have that public engagement. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. We do have, you know, our monthly council meetings. We touch on a lot of these issues or we talk about work force housing so many times this year um, because it's something that is definitely a challenge for all age groups, you know, not just one or the other. Um, and I feel like uh, that is uh, a, a good thing to touch on. Um, another question was in regards, more budget related and actually I think this report was done prior to our new budget being online, but um, you were talking about our budget's lack of comparing historical actuals versus, uh, versus uh, assumptions. Uh, and uh, I think, and maybe Alan could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the new budget actually shows that because it's like real time. Is that correct? Um, <clears throat> yes, ma'am, that is correct. But I just want to point out, point out that we're talking about two different processes here. One uh -huh. is the separate budgeting process, which is addressed with the OpenGov platform. The other that I think Mr. Bauer re references in his report is our forecast budget model, a 10-year model. And that's where I think you're, you're, you're confusing maybe the issue yes. that he pointed out as far as historical results. Uh, he made a simple suggestion that that's not included in our 10-year historical uh, projection model. Uh, but we do have a very thorough process where we go through to analyze our uh, actual results to determine, help us determine what the assumptions are used in our 10-year model. And um, so, I, but I, to your point, the OpenGov platform, the separate budgeting module will assist us greatly in analyzing uh, historical actual financial results, which will help us to determine and project and to, to, to actually prepare the 10-year projection model. Okay. And, and OpenGov has become kind of a standard for a lot of local governments. So. The use of it fits in with where a lot of places are going. And you know, the recommendation that we made as it relates to the 10-year the forecasting model would probably be classified as geeky. It's, you know, it's kind of an inside recommendation that those of us who build and maintain those models can talk back and forth about. I don't think it really materially impacts much of what goes on in the city. Yeah, and I guess for me, somebody that's not in the financial world, I appreciate the new a format model, so to speak. Don't know the actual lingo, <laughs> but um, it is easier uh, to utilize and see 
look at the actuals versus, but I, I get you. I thank you very much for that, um, that explanation. You did touch on it in your presentation, which was one of my questions, and that was, um, you know, why do, why do you still recommend uh, bonding infrastructure, um, especially in this high interest rate environment? You did touch on that a little bit. So um, it, if you can elaborate a little bit as to why you feel that way, just well, so I can understand. So, I, I mean, I can talk about this for but the rest of the day. I don't think you've probably Reader's Digest about. version. Uh, again, <laughs> it's always going to be a, a cost-benefit analysis. Interest rates are higher, but construction inflation has also um, increased significantly, and those are the points of comparison in general for bonding for infrastructure. Uh, again, though, you also have to weigh at what point in time will we be able to use that new uh, infrastructure? And are we going to value that and add that to the equation? And then you have to take into consideration that the federal government is subsidizing part of the cost of borrowing because you get to borrow on a tax exempt basis. So in general, you know, governments are still bonding. It's not at the same level as it was before interest rates went up because some of the projects are gonna fall off. You know, they're on the margin. But this one, um, and this isn't my world, this is Jay Glover's world, but he's still of the opinion that if we do the analysis, and that's what they would do, they would run it both ways and show you the results. They're still of the opinion that for these kinds of public infrastructure projects, it's probably a good deal. Taking a, when you build into uh, what you think the construction industry inflation is going to be going forward. Thank you. And uh, last question, and then I'll share some of my takeaways, but um, you were talking a little bit uh, of our millage rate and the fact that we've kept it you know, the same, which is great. Can you give me your thoughts on uh, millage versus other revenue sources, which you did touch on in the report, um, you know, such as user fees or uh, other, I know we keep our, we pride ourselves in keeping you know, our no garbage tax and our communication tax is a lot, is half that of almost all the other municipalities, things like that. Yeah, and we had a fairly lengthy discussion um, with the finance folks about comparisons. Because you're right, you can't just compare the millage rate for different entities because different places do things differently. Some include um, public safety and they have, or they have separate surcharges for that and then the, all the other fees and things that you're talking about. The first thing that we say is you want to have a diversified revenue structure. You don't want to simply rely on one, you, know, you don't want just want one egg, big, one big, big egg in the basket because if it cracks, you're in trouble. So maintaining a diversity of revenue sources is good, but realize that by far the most stable revenue source in almost any economic environment is the real property tax. So that's why we believe that it's important that you um, keep that at a level that is relatively stable and it doesn't fluctuate too much because the public will um, push back if there's fluctuation that they see that they don't or they, they're not going to understand. I mean, that's that's what caused Proposition 13 in California, which has created all sorts of issues for their property tax structure. It created the Taxpayer Bill of Rights in uh, Colorado. So. I think where you're at is a pretty good place, and you're probably going to be able to stay there in the foreseeable future because you've got all this other stuff going on. But we just always think of the real property taxes, the gold standard for local governments. It's also the one that the state usually doesn't fiddle with as much as other sources. I mean, you can charge for services, but you can't charge more than the cost of providing the service. If you do, it's a tax, and the state is going to have issues with that. So you see those kinds of places where the state will push back in a variety of other local taxes, but they really don't as much on real property tax because they don't tax real property. So it's not seen as something that will be in competition with them as it relates to um, taxation. So I'll try to quickly share some of my takeaways after reading this report, if that's okay with you. Uh, yes, unless Rochelle, did you want to ask any more questions before we have Marcy just make more comments that are yeah, comments I, as opposed yeah. to questions? All right, so if you have comments and she has questions, let's go back to her questions yeah. first so that we get them answered. Yeah, I'm going to do comments either, so. 100%. Okay. Could you explain a little more about the tax abatement idea and whether you're talking about residential and commercial or just residential revitalization and how it works, exactly what happens? Sure. I was talking just about residential. And this is there are different programs. They don't all look exactly alike. But one... So, for example, that just focuses on 
rehabilitation, um, a property owner would make improvements to their property and submit uh, the, you know, it can be a plan, it can be an application to the taxing entity. And then for whatever period of time you select, sometimes it's five years, sometimes it's 10 years, sometimes it's 15 years. Um, 10 years is kind of pretty common. For that period of time, the improvements on the property are abated for tax purposes. They still pay property taxes on the original, you know, the dwelling, but that improvement is not taxed for whatever that period of time is. Then, of course, once that period runs out, it goes back onto the regular tax rolls. Would the city need to set up its own department on that, or would that go through Dorothy Jacks and the, the tax collector's office? Most, most places it's done through, the, it, when the county is the uh, property tax assessor, as it right. is in most states, the county still operates that, you know, that function. But they're, you know, they're aware of the fact that in that community, that share of the property will be abated for whatever length of time. So it's not a, you don't set up a city entity to do that. We would have to set it up by ordinance here and then the county would just administer it? That's the way it's run just about everywhere that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, in your discussion on expanding the TOD, is there any list? Have, have, have you put it down anywhere what taking it out one mile or three mile would include? Do we know what other key properties would yeah. come into play at the one and three mile mark? I, I think I don't remember exactly if it's in there, but. I'm <laughs> I, I would be happy to address that question. So the TOD was, is a geographical area that it is uh, w within a half mile radius of the future designated light rail station, which is generally located at PGA and A1A where the FEC rail tracks are. Um, in potentially expanding the TOD, um, then that would be all of the areas potentially outside that, uh, out, outside that area. Technically, the mall is just on the cusp of that half mile radius. So in order to evaluate expansion, the planning department in conjunction with all of the other development review committee members and staff uh, we always would look at compatibility because the TOD is intended to provide significant incentives toward increasing density, vibrant mix, mixture of uses, but like always, you want to make sure that it's done with the um, uh, mindset of compatibility. Um, but uh, it certainly is on the horizon. In fact, there was um, graphics that were included in the document itself that Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council provided as part of the report that included graphics of the mall. So uh, there has been already some forethought of that, but the expansion of the density would have to be evaluated with the utmost consideration to our existing communities. And I think one mile was kind of what we were considering as the kind of the sweet spot. Anything other than the mall, Natalie, that that is is major development redevelopment in that one mile? Expansion? We have not looked at that at we this point in okay. time, but that would be an okay. exercise that we would have to go through in order to evaluate the expansion. So, okay, that's all in there. Thank you. Okay, um, what about the balance of the increased densities within the the TOD and moving forward with increasing mobility at the same time? Did you look at the, the difficulties with that, or is that something that, that you're recommending we do internally? Because it's like the, the cart before the egg, you're, you're gonna put all this density in, then everybody's complaining about the traffic, and then you gotta go back and do the mobility. It's kinda gotta work together. Well, I, I mean, I think the nice thing is you already do have a mobility plan that you're working on. Um, you know, the TOD is also in further along in some ways in some of the density projects that might occur. So I think our general, obviously it's something you're gonna to have to continue to manage and it's always a balancing act, but from our perspective, you can, um, you can add more density and you won't necessarily create um, huge issues. Not forever, of course, you know, you, you know you're gonna to have to have some point where you say, okay, oh, I'm sorry, I mean, don't go away, where you know, it's, it's dense enough, but we don't think that's there yet. Okay, and I guess the last one 
had to do with, um, you mentioned in the report, one, one of the problems that cities face is that outside corporations are coming in and purchasing housing as part of the workforce housing. Can you go into more detail on that and, and methods that cities can use to prevent that from happening? I mean, there's a real challenge across the country in that investors are purchasing a very significant portion of housing um, for rent purposes, and, and it's driving up rents, too. Um, I don't know if I can comment much further than that on it, but it, it's, uh, it's an issue across the country that cities are having to deal with, and I'm sure you're going to have to as well. No recommendations as yet on what other cities are doing I, to prevent? I don't have any recommendations right now. I think that's this is one of those kind of open questions that you all need to be aware of, and, um, and smarter minds than mine are going to have to figure it out. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Marcy, we'll come back to you for your comments. Okay. Now. now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, as I said, I have a lot of takeaways from this. Uh, I was very, I really, really enjoyed this report. It brought a lot of um, thought to it, and now I've been thinking about it ever since I've read it. Um, one of them, which is I, I'm proud to say, and I know we all are, is that the we, the city of Palm Beach Gardens, has the lowest population per square mile, which you wouldn't think, considering our diversity in land use and economic development, um, and you know, 60,000 people. So I appreciated that point being made in the report. Um, also, again, we're talking about workforce housing because it's on everyone's mind. Um, that's something that we hear no matter where we are. Um, we were just at the League of Cities conference. That was a big topic amongst all of the municipalities and people in, throughout the entire state. Um, and of course, mentioned many times in this report, but I think it's very clear that workforce housing um, is a key component to economic development, um, and it's also vital uh, component to the success of uh, office environment, which we have a very healthy office environment in this city. Um, as a land planner for many years and uh, now managing commercial office space for the last 18 in West Palm and Boca, um, I can attest that all um, of the prospects of recent all ask for affordability for their employees and they want to know when they come here from all over Connecticut and New York and all of all of the Midwest areas they um, they want to know where their you know administrative assistants and employees can live um, so it's it's a big thing and I feel like um, after reading this report you know tax abatement for housing um, uh, in addition to our economic development uh, tax abatement issues or initiatives, uh, urban enterprise zones or transit orient zones, density bonus programs, uh, zoning by right is something that um, I work in Lake County and Orange County a lot. Uh, Horizon West, um, I've seen Lake County's what they did wrong and I've seen what they've done right. They're trying to correct it now actually. In Orange County, they've they created a, uh, like what they call a sector plan, Horizon West, for a big area of the Western community. And, and um, they did things like uh, minimum thresholds for density. And I think you touched on that in your report. Um, not cashing out of, uh, of uh, workforce housing if a development is over a certain size, if it's a, a larger development. Um, all of these things, expanding our TOD that Rochelle just talked about, um, I think these are all things that we should look at because I think they do address um, and help workforce housing on more of an immediate basis versus um, something that could happen you know, with financing over time. Um, I talked about you know, West Palm Beach a little bit and they uh, adopted uh, in their land use regulations micro units um, which is something that the younger generation, for some reason, loves. <laughs> tiny, tiny little places, but they love it. And they love TODs, and, and that's another thing that work environment is touching on. They love to see where the tri-rail station is. Um, and you touched a lot on our rail opportunities, and it's very exciting to see how our city is going to grow in the future, but it's also... I guess challenging and it's something stressful. It's something that our residents and our communities, they ask us about a lot. Um, 
when you say growth, they think density, and then they get very nervous, and then they think traffic. So um, I appreciate your uh, thoughtful criticism, very, very thoughtful, um, because you did talk about consensus building with our communities um, and our business, uh, which, which we do that a lot, but I think at a council meeting it's hard because no one really comes. We don't know who's watching. Having Charette's uh, Treasure Coast, we've brought them in here with Kim Delaney. She does a great job with that. Um, and I think that those are all things that we definitely should consider because it does help out a lot. I know TPA does that. Um, they do a lot of different uh, education events and that's something that is uh, very, very helpful. Um, I think this report outlined the resource, uh, that resources and time are key with our entire development team. Um, we've maintained, you know, after thinking about that, we've maintained relatively about the same number of employees you know, in P&Z and in our building department over the last decade um, with a huge surge in growth and, um, and annexation, I might add. So uh, we know markets are fluid, um, and with that, you know, time lapses, market changes, but I really want to give a kudos to Natalie and her team and Scott and their team um, in our city because after looking at and reading this, um, the report emphasized on how much review and permitting has occurred in the last decade. And when you take a look back, you know, it's impressive. And I just want to say thank you because uh, you've done that with a, a lack of resources for sure, all of you guys. And I appreciate that. And this, this report really pointed that out. And I had to pause and think about that. So I want to say thank you with that. When you touched a little bit on rail, um, it's a costly component to a transit orient zone, definitely. Um, and I know that this says we definitely need to study further or take a, a closer look at it. Um, but you know, we could consider TIFs and GIFs and all of those, you know, tax increment finance districts, all of those opportunities um, for rail, but also for uh, electric uh, Molly the trolley maybe. But we talked about that years ago, and I think now it's coming to fruition. But all of these things should you know, be looked at, um, carefully looked at, because if you, over, if you overdo it with those, it could really put the city in a, in a bind um, if they're too heavily weighted with um, infrastructure costs. And um, after reading this, I realized that Brightline has a much better opportunity to, to coming here first than Tri-Rail. Um, so, but it is exciting and I really would love to see that happen <laughs> in the near future because that really, would really, really be a key to our TOD. Um, uh, and uh, I agree once again that it's important to, uh, to educate our residents because I know that they're concerned about how our city is growing as are we. Um, and I know it's very touchy and change is very hard for people, um, for all people. So um, with somehow doing this thoughtfully um, and uh, cons in a consensus building way, I think it's important. Um, and I think you summed it up um, in your presentation when we said commit, you know, commitment to excellence is uh, a great way, in my opinion, to sum it up. And I think that uh, we all have that goal um, and I appreciate us working together and, and I really appreciate um, having the opportunity to have this workshop. It was very, um, it, it was a great, a great start to the next chapter in our uh, city's lives. And could I make just a couple of comments? Because you made a lot of very good observations. Um, one would be that we have had conversations around density and the city has already upped its minimum density levels in some areas. So that is an area that they're aware of and taking that into consideration. The other is just the concept of um, density in general. One of the things that I think the city also did a good job with in, in the Western development is that they set aside uh, a, a lot of land there that will not be developed. And a city that has a pretty good reputation for setting aside land for parks and recreation is Minneapolis, for example. And I actually grew up in that area and, um, and it's something that the residents really appreciate as well. So even though you are going to densify in some areas, it doesn't mean you're gonna do it everywhere. And I think that's a, a good approach. Thank you, and I do, uh, Natalie had a good point, which is trip capture. And I think that is something that, it's hard to digest that term, 
but it is a reality. If you have a mixed use development, you can really capture a lot of trips that would, would, would potentially be on our roadways, and they are within keeping it within Alton and keeping it within Avenir. And those are two great now come to life opportunities where they're right here and we can see it happening. I live right on Donald Ross Road. I see Alton's trip capture opportunities with the golf carts parked at Publix and, and the kids riding their bikes to the restaurants. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing that we now have in our city. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, now, we are not open to public comment, but we do have our county commissioner here today. So I would like to invite you to come up and if you have any comments while we're here, you're welcome to do so. Um, as the past, uh, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, tri rail. I think that the conversation should be more geared toward Bright Line and Tri Rail, even as the immediate past chair of SFRTA, the Tri Rail. Um, I think the feasibility of Tri Rail and Bright Line being on the same track is something that is going to be really, really far into the future. And I think with Bright Line, what you will see is they're going to continue through to Orlando and Tampa. Once they finish that, they will see what the demands are along the track. And I think you might see. Uh, Bright line realize that gardens would be another good intermediate area, but they are a high speed high speed rail, and that's their idea. So, uh, I believe that the TOD should be looking at more of a bright line perspective than a tri rail perspective. I don't see and tri rail just we just don't have the money, uh, and even with a transportation surtax uh, possibility in the future, um, don't know how that's going to happen. Along because in order for tri rail to actually be coming up this way, you know, their the vision was to have a bunch of other stations terminating in Jupiter and having some in West Palm and Lake Park. I don't think you'll see that happening. But uh, from a Brightline perspective, you know, all we all I can say is keep pushing Brightline about uh, partnering with them for uh, a station, and that is the ideal spot. So, um, and from the county perspective, you all are doing a great job here. Um, I appreciate always being involved and thank you for putting me on your email list so I get the information and this was a great presentation today and we are family. We always have been, we always will be and uh, thank you to staff for all you do. So thank you for recognizing me. Thank you Maybe. for coming up and taking the time to come today. So as Maria said, we there, there is a familial feeling up here. This is a great team to work on, which means that while everyone was asking their questions, I crossed through all of mine. So I actually don't have any questions. Thank you guys so much for making my job easier. I do have a brief amount of comments, if you'd indulge me, please. Um, now, I find that this study showed a really clear vision specifically for our residents or those of us who aren't up here, who aren't on staff and who don't live, eat, drink, and breathe this stuff every day. Um, the review of our stability, our budget, our financial stability, our bond rating, our lack of debt, our stable tax rating, solid infrastructure, um, that we're attracting population growth, that we are attracting even more events, that our uh, ability to bring commerce into the city has been so successful. And the best part for me about the um, study was showing the team management and our leadership here in the city on city council, we're just here for a few years. You guys are here for decades. And to have you do this work and have it be highlighted and, ma and made more simple for anyone to understand it was really extraordinary. Um, as you were talking about before, it's really very rarely do you see that kind of interconnected um, support through staff, which we do have. Uh, it shows the staff's commitment to excellence and, and by that token also this council's desire to have excellence and extraordinarily quality of life services for our residents. Um, so it's a vision document. It wasn't really just a checkup, I think. It went further. Um, we now have memorialized what we've done and we've also been able to give a really clear look into the future. So as I've reflected on this, it helps us to transition here on council since we do have term limits. Now we have a memorialized document so that people can truly understand what has been done 
and what the hopes are going forward. Um, it's kind of like a strategic plan that we didn't even know we were asking for. So it's kind of extraordinary to see that. So I would like to ask our city manager and perhaps our attorney if what we can do to bring this forward so it's sort of a council plan going forward so that as my term will end and we will be losing two council members in March that we can think of it kind of as a strategic plan that we might consider adopting for our council. Is that possible? Of course, if that's what the council wants, we can bring it back in a future agenda for you all uh, to formally adopt as your strategic plan or vision. If you would like that, we can probably schedule that for after budget review. After budget, after budget. Yes. Budgets, budget's our job, we've got that, but this, this is just such a, a good document for those who may come after us. We don't need yes. to reinvent the wheel, we just need to keep doing what we're doing. We can do that, and for your information, after this workshop today, the report will go online for anyone and everyone to review. Madam Mayor, I think that's a great idea, and I absolutely agree with you. Thank you. All right, uh, do you want to take any other consensus? Are you guys okay with that, Rochelle? Yeah. No, I, have, I, I totally agree. I think it's a great idea, and I don't know whether this is where we're supposed we, to... No, we'll have to bring it back. We'll bring it back. No, not oh. discuss that, but to, to go further with Tess Ron, so the only constant is change, and change can be good or bad, and we know the city is on the right track, and our change, as far as we see it and what we've been involved with, has been good. But conveying that to the residents is not always there. We'll have a workshop, we have council meetings, but they're not there, and until something happens in their backyard and the development comes, <laughs> they don't pay attention. And we were reminded of that at last council meeting, um, very vocally. So how do we do a better job of making sure that the community understands what this really means? that you know, growth is gonna happen and it's how we manage that growth that really counts, that because we're the great city that we are, people wanna come and they wanna live here. We don't own all of the property that gets developed. There's inherent property rights. So how, where do we take this from now to the community? Well, I'm sorry. Um, I left my magic wand, my other suit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how in the world we could possibly uh, address all of the citizens and, and what their thoughts are as far as growth and traffic is concerned, but uh, we'll talk it over at a staff level, and uh, you know, the best we can do, the best communication device we've found so far that the residents like is getting something in the mail. Obviously, this 81 four-page report uh, can't be done like that, but perhaps uh, we could devise some type of a uh, condensed report, special edition for Signature City that does go into every uh, household. Also, uh, when we go to I, the I can't make them read it though. If we go to the communities, uh, just as we bring you know, right. reports, we should probably have something like this available. If, if there's a yes. bullet point slideshow that, that can we, be put as part of that presentation. We have a presentation already prepared right for us to go out right now. Not, not, to, put, not to put more on canvas <laughs> on all of this. Have we considered any outside PR help on this specific initiative at all? Is that something... That's the only reality. thing that we have considered at this point is putting it out on the website and alerting those people how you do that in social media that it's out there and available to read and those interested parties will look at it. Uh, it's going to be tough to get someone to read the 84 pages of the average citizen. But let us think about it. Let us put our heads together. Maybe come out with some kind of a condensed, revised edition to hit the highlights so that citizens can see that uh, at, and they could understand, we could put it so they could understand it, uh, the highlights anyway of this. Let us work on that. Uh, I, I wanna add, live on that too. Um, Rochelle, good question and I agree with you. Sometimes the communities, they, they also are, like you said, silo is a good word. They have their own HOAs and they work and, and then they don't realize until it's something that's coming up in their backyard. However, I remember in the past, 
um, Natalie and staff had worked with Kim Delaney, um, and I can't remember what subject matter it was now, it was a long time ago, and they set up um, like stations and asked the community for you know, input uh, through a, so I guess it was a workshop. And in addition to that, Avenir did a very good um, several community outreach um, opportunities when they were going through their many years of, uh, of planning their development. And those were successful because they did, and they look, they look at them now, they started with like what I called 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound sack. Uh, of density, but then they came out with a, a very, very thoughtful program after they build consensus, built consensus with not just the city, but with the community, and, and that being stakeholders, including our residential communities that definitely voiced their concerns for sure, but they did a great job uh, also um, with their community outreach process, and I know that um, Natalie has a lot more uh, experience with some of those, I guess, charrettes and workshops that they've done in the past. Those were charrettes for the TOD, and that's we work closely yeah. with Treasure Coast on yeah, that. Yeah, Treasure Coast, that's right, yeah. Rochelle, did you have Like I said, give us an opportunity to take a look, and we'll talk about how we can uh, distribute this information to the community at large. No, I just wanted to echo quickly Marcy's thanks to s staff and, and city manager and management for the proactive planning that was talked about in here. I know it took many years leading up to it, but so much of this happened in the last six years as I've been on council that it's actually come to fruition, most of what's in the document. But I just want to say thank you and let you know that we recognize that this started way, way before that. And I, we appreciate the planning. All right, thank you, Mr. Bauer. We appreciate you coming here today. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions or comments, this meeting is adjourned.